Okay, Jay, set the table. I think I want to know that some other people kind of go through what I go through with content. You know, some days you don't feel like making videos or you just kind of have other things going on. you got to find a balance. Honestly, balance. How do you guys find a balance in this hobby, being a collector, doing it as a business, trying to do the videos, the podcast? I mean, I only do one podcast episode a week to keep a balance. And it's like, at that point, it's like i got to get a guest and i got to do this. And it's like, and I want to do other things, you know, and I have some ideas I want to put forward. So I'm just... I just kind of want to, I, I mean, I, I always feel like if you have to ask the question, it's so you can listen. So I want to hear everybody else. I think that it needs to be, we need to remember that we're, we're teachers, we're educators, we're, we're, we're sharing information for other people to learn about. And yes, it's a struggle to get up every morning, and it's a struggle to turn on the YouTube, and it's a struggle to, to make sure you're clear headed. but. At the end of the day, when you remember that you know, you're teaching people and they're learning and you get that affirmation back, that's, for me, that's what does it. it it's that in the morning. So. And uh, just kind of piggybacking off that some, I mean, one thing that helped me a lot would be not even, because a lot of it, like you say, it can be overwhelming when you look at all of it as a big picture to fill out that full episode, but maybe breaking it down into little pieces, like taking pieces, like uh, maybe not looking at it as doing it all at once, but maybe trying to hammer out that interview sometime, maybe trying to bank a couple of them, you know, so you, so that isn't so important at one time. Things like that can cut down some time necessarily, but then... One thing that always helped me was formatting, like like really structuring and formatting and setting up everything. I think that can really alleviate some of that stress, especially when it comes down to the last minute. Drew, can Drew, you lost your co-host, and, and I know that was very important to you. And it, you struggled for a while to do another podcast very, after that. Yes. So tell us the thought process of getting back into it. Um, well, I mean, I took probably two and a half, three months off uh, before I put out an episode. It was, came out of nowhere. It was a really big shock. And um, I mean, more than anything, it was a lot of people in this room. It was John, it was you guys, it was Eric, who was here from day one. Uh, I think the day I started a podcast, he reached out. It was a lot of people in this room. Uh, I've been another one that really reached out and knew what I was going through and really, you know, helped me on board. But then it also, after a while, after the, the grieving process moved back, it was, what would Stu want to do? And if I had stopped over that, oh, that would have been the worst thing that Stu ever would have wanted. So that's kind of what made me want to keep going in that respect. So basically, other podcasters encourage you to yes. saddle back up. Yes, big time. And yeah. we're really there for me without without me having to ask. I mean, it was them reaching out. It was an outpouring of. It, it really made me appreciate, and that's something that I try and say on my show as much as possible. The community aspect of of our little community in this hobby is so strong, it's so big, and you know the, that's really what brought me back into wanting to do it again. And, you know. Three years later, we're still going. <laughs> so, Jay, are you getting encouragement from other podcasters or other YouTubers to, to kind of <clears throat> press on? Yeah, 100%. I mean, the show goes on. <laughs> but uh, I think structure and format helps, man. I think uh, for me, I just it's a balance, man. I mean, I still got friends. I'm 26. You know, I still got a life ahead of me. You know, and I just, just taking it one day at a time. I think it's okay to take a break too. If you got to take yeah. a pause, I think that's yeah. healthy. I don't. There's no rule that says, you know, I come out every Friday, but I've missed a few Fridays here and there. I don't think that's uh, wrong to do, you know. So if if, if you need to do that, then you got to go. You got to do that. I mean, I'm the definition of struggle. I haven't produced any sort of solid content in a while now. In fact, my last blog post, I think, was March. I just haven't felt the the urge to have an argument online lately. But um, it's just, I finally started this morning having more arguments online. If you know me, you'll figure that out. But um, um, 
being a part of the early days of About the Cards, it was, I was going to sit, sit in, a, in a few episodes instead of him, and I just, I can't be consistent, and I feel that hurts the podcast, so hence the, the figurehead, and I will, and I will take my back seat. <laughs> uh, real quick to add to that, I started my station, I think, March or April 2020, and then yesterday I just passed over, um, 15k on my YouTube station and it was a lot of work but what's helped me the most is I've spent so much time learning how to create content and actually creating less and actually trying to improve it every single time so I had a background in hosting and modeling but also in learning how to story tell and structure YouTube videos so whatever your platform is it may be better to relate to the audience if you do less content but learn how to craft it and get better every time because that's just worked for me. So I'm, I'm all about less is more quality over quantity and just improving one video at a time. I will say alongside that, as far as the consistency goes, we try to be extremely consistent because I think one of the most important parts about consistency is that people tune in to hear from you. So they're expecting to hear from you. They're wanting to hear from you. They're giving you their time and out of their day, out of their schedule, to tune into what you're doing. So um, I completely understand needing breaks. Like that's absolutely natural as a human. We get burnt out, we get all of that stuff. But to me, the way I've always looked at content is if the audience member is willing to give you a moment of their time, you should respect it and try to give them a consistent schedule where they know they're going to be having something within their hand or on their YouTube schedule or a notification saying hey the new episode is out or or hey the the top five is up but it's that consistency where they know that they can rely on you because they give you your they give you their time so that's just where i come at with the viewpoint of consistency and, and real quick consistency could be once a week once every two weeks, right. whatever it is. right it's whatever works for yeah. you and i'll bash too i'll do three or four videos and know i'm good and be like, all right, this will be out, and then I can just answer comments, or I can just take a break and and just chill out for a moment. But at least I have the next couple of weeks taken care of. <clears throat> if without batching, I'd be lost. I'd like to share something on the micromanagement piece of, of content production that um, we think about, like scheduling and things. But there's also this other piece of it. You know, I carry around a Notepad app on my phone, and whenever I think of an idea, I just plug it in because I can't remember everything. And so then I go back and then I kind of scrub the content. I have stuff dating back from you know, 2012 that I've thought about that I haven't blogged about yet or whatever. And I might figure out the right place to put it. Is it a blog? Is it a podcast? Is it a video? And over the course of a couple of weeks, I might have enough content to create 10, 20 minutes of good solid dialogue. And if I can't get a, a host on, it's usually just me anyway. So you, know, you can just produce it on your phone using voice memo and then you know, dump it on your your dump it onto your desktop and get it going. It, you know, try to think less about, like he was saying, quality over quantity, but at the same time, don't overthink, don't group think your, your, your content. You know, just realize nothing is ever perfect, but that's the beauty of it. If you, you can break a, all of this here when you're producing content, you should think, am I either entertaining someone or, or educating someone? Mm -hmm. At the core of it, every one of, every piece of content we put out, am I doing one of those two things or hopefully both? I yes. try to be both self-deprecating and, <laughs> and be educational at the same time. And if you're, if you're passionate about this hobby, it, it's going to come across. I mean, that, if you're not evoking that in someone else, you know, are you doing it right? You know, are you thinking about it right? Maybe just entertain, educate, right? That's, think of all the channels you love to watch or listen to. They have one of those components, right? They're either educating you or entertaining you. And uh, not everybody will entertain or educate everyone else. You know, you're not going to like everybody. That's part of it, too. It's except that not, some people aren't going to like what you do. And that's, you know, kind of hard to do if you're going I'm, I'm struck that about half of the podcasters in this room are kind of like sole proprietors. They just, they're, they do it themselves. And the other half are part of a team. Whether they have a co-host or something, are you, are you, a, you know, is it mainly you? Oh, because yeah. there's, I'm just saying, but there's half the people in here, I think, probably really delight in having a teammate. Yeah, that's, uh, you know, I got to talk about that, actually, it's important. Uh, 
you know, I think the first style show what I learned is one man army is pretty tough, even as a card shop and everything. And like I had this, I had to sacrifice and swallow that pillow pride. And, and that's when I got Mike. Mike and I knew each other for ten years, and he's edited and helped me so much. And I know at Mojo Sports we got a team that we're ready to form. And I've talked to people that I can honestly trust. And it just I had to swallow that pride, man. And it just took a little maturing and, and some time, and actually like learning from other people. And I really appreciate your guys' suggestions because it helps a lot. So. Awesome, thank you. I, I wanted to add, you know, if you're looking for inspiration, um, you know, first off, my background, I was in Hollywood for a decade, uh, behind the scenes working with stuff. But the writers are always taught, like, one, you write no matter what, even if you're not inspired. So I think that's the first step, especially in the YouTube world, where it's like, oh, anyone can do it, you know, but sometimes we don't feel inspired. So it's like three, three pages a day is what a writer is supposed to write whether they're inspired or not in screenwriting. Um, so applying that mentality and saying, look, I'm going to work on it every day, but some one place where I find incredible inspiration when I'm not feeling it is in my metrics. I look back and I say, wait, what was popular? What did drive good engagement? What had a lot of comments? And maybe I never actually responded to all 20 of those comments or all 20 of those replies. There's a reply I didn't respond to, and I know this is popular that'll inspire the next thing. So it's really good to look at your metrics when you're, you know, sometimes we're coasting, we're doing good, but if we ever hit a wall, we're like, what should I be talking about? Metrics can help with that. Yeah, alongside that, if there's something that you do that works, roll with that. Learn how to take that and, and branch that into other, other aspects as well. So in the sense of like, you do a, a you do a particular IGTV episode, and it does really well. Look and see what people are responding to, what they're latching on to, and take that and see, well, okay, what can the olive branch do now? I would also say, in that regard, one of the things that I, I think I really pride myself with, the way I've come at, I came also from Hollywood. I was a writer, I was an actor, I directed, I produced. So I'm coming at it from a very different angle than you know what some of you guys have come at it with which is perfectly fine everybody should have different angles but I also think we should all try to be brave and bold there are a lot of things that we can be doing that I think can be out of the box and that to me is exciting and I think that that to the community is also exciting what can you be doing that maybe isn't <laughs> like completely groundbreaking as far as in the, the context of the world, but what can you be doing in the context of the sports card world that is groundbreaking? Like that's exciting to people because they, that in itself will translate into growth and, and broadening of the hobby. And I think that's what we're all here for anyway, is the growth of the hobby. So that's where I'm coming at it. Just, you can be bold, you can be brave, Try something new. If it doesn't work, it doesn't work, but you tried it. Yeah, to, just to piggyback real quick, I remember taking a commercial acting workshop in LA, and the casting director, the one that uh, held the workshop, he said, look, whatever you do, when you go in for that commercial audition, as long as you don't play it safe, you need to be 100% you, because either you land it or you don't, but at least they know you're the guy or not. If you play it safe, you're, you can't be vanilla. So whatever you are, whoever you are, whatever you bring, go in on it and not everyone will like it, but your people will love you. So, um, and the other thing to add to the education and entertain is I also heard inspire. So if you do all three, you're irreplaceable. So if you think of Gary V, whether you like him or not, he entertains, he educates, and he inspires, and that's why people are drawn to him. So, I mean, I always try to think, what can I incorporate of entertain, educate, and then hopefully inspire to take action in the, the card hobby, or just to watch the next video. So I want to throw something on the wall. As I look around this room, I know pretty much all of you and what you do and, and you know, kind of where you fall. Some are more collector based, some are more investor and you're, you know, you do a lot of things to make money in the hobby and there's nothing wrong with that one way or the other, whether I disagree with you or not. But I feel like, and I've had this conversation with somebody in this room via private message and I've said, are you spreading yourself too thin? And I guess I feel like some of the ones that have spoken up and have had more of the issues with 
you know, struggles and then this is what we've done. Are you all spreading yourself too thin by having a YouTube channel, by having a blog, by doing six other things? And is maybe that one of the things that if you took one of those away, you know, you're not spreading your inspiration or your topics so thin and you maybe just get it a little more reeled in and it makes it easier. I don't feel some of the uh, ones that are, you know, is concerned about that or the more collector based people. Again, right, wrong and different. I, you all know I'm very opinionated and I'm not in this case, I'm not judging anyone, but I think it's a little bit easier. But those people that are the collector base tend to maybe only have their one medium that they're on. And then others have a website, a YouTube page, uh, you know, other other uh, int website interests and things like that. So I wonder if that kind of causes some of that lack of, you know, motivation or whatever, because you're trying to put different stuff out everywhere, but maybe could you put it, just condense it just a little bit. Well, there's a reality we all face as content creators is, look, I'm a thousand videos into my YouTube career. I'm, you're not coming up with new ideas. As much as you might think you have a new idea, somebody's done it before. And what's that? You can always repurpose old stuff. Of course. And no. then reapply it to current. No, I'm know? not saying you can't even put a, you know, you, I have this original great idea. I promise you somebody's done it before. Yes. And the point is, that's not the point. They're there to watch you because they have connected with you at some level. And they want to hear your spin on that, your personal experience with a card. Uh, Dave done videos about a 52 tops mantle. We all know we all know what a mantle looks like. like. I don't need to see a new mantle. I don't need to see another one. I, every, I can see any card I want on eBay anytime. But what he, you know, anyone, not just Dave, but anybody talks about it. That's what I want to hear. I want to hear the connection for you, the stories, the, John, you do a great job of that when you tell stories too. Just put something personal with it and people are going to connect with that. that. You want that personal connection. Love it or hate it. And that will create, ironically, the, the people that really enjoy your stuff and the people that don't connect with it. And that's fine. That's going to happen no matter what. It's like so. Monday morning, who are you turning to to listen to about the football games? Is it Skip Bayless? Is it Stephen A. Smith? What anchor or what commentator is the one that you want to get their take on? They're all talking about the same game, but it's their conviction and their personality that makes them special to you and makes you tune in to them versus everyone else. I have the same approach with me. I haven't heard, uh, I haven't, there's always all kinds of hate coming at Beckett because that's, you know, I work at Beckett and, well, you're outdated. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. You're outdated. Yeah, 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 yeah. Like, it's, it's all the same. I just, I've always tried to take the approach to, 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 to connect with my audience on some level. It's not going to be for everybody. It, you just got to learn to, uh, to, to let that roll off your shoulder. I mean, it, it might be easier said than done, but it's just it's how it is. Jim mentioned earlier, I'm almost to 500 episodes, and that's a lot of work. It's, it's a whole lot of work, but I have my audience that I connect with. I don't worry about being first in the space or breaking news because, I mean, everybody, that's, that's the angle everybody tries. And sometimes it works and sometimes it don't. It's, I just find it doesn't work for me. I just connect with my audience, like Mike said and go from there. I have a really fun anecdote on that from Hollywood. Mm -hmm. um, I worked on a film called Confessions of a Shopaholic, which spent $60 million marketing because they wanted, but who did they market to? They marketed to everybody. You know, oh, it's, a, it's a good film for everybody. It's funny, it's fun, it's fun. And the movie flopped. Mm -hmm. And then you look at a horror movie. And a horror movie's like, we need to sell one million tickets. If we sell one million tickets, that's a $10 million box office opening weekend, you know, or 20 million now, I don't know what inflation is. It's like 20 million is enough to make our money back on the $2 million film. Mm -hmm. And horror fans go to see horror movies, you know? So do you want to be the rom-com that's trying to get everybody and actually costs a lot more money to try to get people to see it? Or do you just want to be, this is me, you know? I'm, this card collector, I'm this personality, I'm, you know, I'm investment focused, I'm collecting focused. I think it, there's so much more power to being in your lane and not worrying about the fact that there's a show that is the exact opposite of you. Mm -hmm. And people watch that too. Yeah, that's good. Okay, time's up on that one. Well, Patrick, that was your question, right? The, or your comment about transparency. Yeah, it's something about, as I mentioned, blogging about something I don't own but I want, and then all of a sudden now I have to pay quite a bit more for it when it surfaces because people read my blog post. 
So I'm okay to do that. I've been doing this a long time, but because I'm passionate about the content, it's more just, I don't really know if there was much of a question there. It's more just, you have to just accept that what your content is about might produce a monetary value of something that you still desire to be much, uh, might manipulate the, 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 the value of something you still desire because I'm the content you're producing. Back to uh, a version of FOMO that is FOMO forever, that you're never going to see this card again. And right. I'm never going to see a card. I don't think I'm ever going to see it. And I'm Patrick and I want that card. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say, hey, I really want that card. Yeah. Okay. If it's a run-of-the-mill card, you're probably going to see, right. and you tell people you want it, and a lot of people have it, and you say, hey, here comes Patrick. <laughs> He's the one that's going to pay extra for this card. So, so FOMO forever means that's a legit FOMO. I'm never going to see this again. Rich and I, when we you know, through the National looking for type cards that we've never seen before, if we've never seen it, if Rich has never seen it, I've never seen it. Doesn't exist. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, so, yeah. so the FOMO aspect is if you see it all the time, FOMO is just trying to regulate your greed or your or your or your your wallet. That I can buy it now before it goes up, but it might not go up, it might go down. If I tell people I want it, that might make it go up, but it might not. But it might give me access to that card, yeah. which is the other benefit anything, to that. Because so it's not worth doing if it's a common card. No, no, no. Typically, the but stuff that really I would talk about card. is, yeah, yeah. Net, net. I would, I would tell people. Right. In fact, especially in the social media world, there's, there's random acts of kindness. Right. Mm -hmm. You're just uh, as likely for somebody to come up and say, "Hey, Patrick, uh, here it is." I'll tell the story in a different way. Eight, eight, when I was setting up at the Nationals in the '80s, I remember this father and son coming to my table the second day and basically buying every oddball Hubie Brooks card I had. Mm -hmm. They scoured the show on the first day looking for Hubie Brooks cards, and then the second day they, came, they said, we're hitting your table, you have more than anybody else. They understood that the odds of any of those Hubie Brooks cards selling were slim and none, and slim mm -hmm. had already gone back to uh, Plano. And so, but if they're looking for an 88, let's say, a Pebble Beach Joe DiMaggio card, which is one of the very first signed cards. It's not certified, but it basically is certified. There are six people in the set, and they're all signed from 1935. If they saw one at that show and they didn't grab it, somebody else would have immediately. And, that's, and that, I think, is an extreme point, but that's, I think, the point you're making, too, to some extent. This happens a lot to us with our Ryan Eads collection. He is basically a minor league pitcher. <laughs> And even though he didn't even have a job in 2020, one of his one of ones was being sold to us through eBay for $700. <laughs> because there's literally only us that's going to buy this card. And he had picked us out and he's like, I'm going to make you pay. And it's still sitting there. <laughs> See also Andrew Shaw. <laughs> so so to you, I have this same issue with uh, 59 Top Spring Side Brunton. It's a card that I have wanted for years and I could have bought it a few times but I never pulled the trigger and I and I'm not saying that I spoke about it and it shot through the roof but I spoke about it and then the next day it's it's two three hundred dollars more than what it was and I was like well, now I've kicked myself in the foot because I want this card I'm not gonna be able to I'm not gonna buy it at that price especially when it was the, the price before it was the day before you know it's it's a it's a horrible catch-22 that you play it's I figured you know we, we the one thing that, that we all have is we, we're all passionate about something, so we should get that out into the ethos, whatever that is, as soon as you can, uh, because time is of the essence. And so if you don't have it, it's okay that you don't have it. You can talk about it, and for a moment, and you're mentally, you, you, you have at least a, a, a thought about it, mm -hmm. and you can share that with somebody else. Somebody else might be like, well, I, let me see if I have that. Oh, okay, you know, maybe I'll put it up and see if, and th th it, it's kind of weird how that works out. You put something out there, and, it's not a guarantee, but you, there, there's a chance that it might come back to you in a way. Like, you might find that card now because it's available. Like, when big sales happen, then a couple other sales of the same card happen. You haven't seen the card in 10 years. Finally, there are three consecutive sales over the course of four months because one came up. Right. So now you have four opportunities. And so that's, that's actually, I think, the, the one benefit that's not a guarantee. But just the, the thought of knowing that 
If I talk about this now, there might be a chance that I'll see one, at least see one, hit auction over the next whatever if someone reads this and they have it. So that's, that's kind of a nice thought. I'm curious, uh, Dr. Beckett, do you have any fun buying stories from, from your days when the catalog was in its infancy and no, no. scouring shows? No, there, there's, there's no fun buying stories when I started to advise God. <laughs> <laughs> Because I didn't. I mean, I passed uh, the, 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 the sad buying stories or the purchases that were not made. I'm looking at a table where, you know, we're tracking to see what cards are selling for. I'm looking at a card that's dramatically underpriced. It would be a steal, and, but it's, you know, and, and I just walk on by. And it, that's hard. That's hard, especially if it's Roberto Clemente. So, no, so it's, it, it didn't like that. You know, I, I think Rich and I, when we were going around, the thrill was in seeing something we'd never seen before. And you know, they, in, in the, in it, it, we're mainly talking about 10 or more years ago, 15 years ago. The prices weren't, if, if you'd never seen the card before, you know, maybe it'd be 100 bucks. But it could be the only one. Well, our dear, my, my dear friend, and you know him too, Arizona Hank Rhesus. Yeah. And he's, he set up the last two shows here, and he had some ABA set. I had never seen before. And you actually mentioned seeing that on one of your podcasts, but it was something where that part of me kicked in saying, I've never seen that before. And he actually was carrying Sanchez's old basketball card price guide from 92 saying, these are the mistakes in it. This is when it really is, just to show how long it's been ex extant and to show it. But it was something you and I, I don't remember we ever seen before. And it was exciting to see something, and that was from 25 years ago, and it kicked in to see. That's interesting. I've never seen that. And there's, and there's you, Logan, you do a lot of obscure NASCAR stuff, and so do you, Val, and I'm sure you have that same feeling when you see. Yeah, the 1972 STP cards are some of the cards that we really look for all the time. And with all this, going all the hobby down, the price increases, we've seen probably more of those cards in the last four months than we've probably seen in the last four years. And of course, the prices have gone way up. And there have been a couple that I've needed, but it's just I can't pay that price. And I don't know if it's because that I put content out on those um, before that. There's, they were in the price guide, but no history. But we've been chasing them for the last 15 years, and things that we've learned, people we've talked to, that I put on the podcast. So uh, the stuff is starting to come out with the 70 testings, like I said, and escalated quickly. Quickly, so Petty was like 200 now, 15,000. And I haven't really heard anything from our House of Jordan people after the introduction, so I'd like to, I'd like them to say something if they feel comfortable. I don't know. Well, ratio price. So the, this is like the Richard Petty thing. I mean, that's, it, it, it was dormant, and nobody brought it out. Now it went up. You guys have algorithms that uh, suggest that this could be priced at this level because it's related to another player, another set, another something in a similar condition or in a lesser condition. Sure. So but that's empirical in the way you develop the Yeah, the we're ratios. also doing something a lot more humble and basic than that. It's and it's inspired by you. Um, the early price guides with Beckett and of course the later ones would take, for example, 93, 94 finals basketball and you'd have the base and you'd say refractor, you know, 10x the high column. And so similarly, um, in today's market, we have more precise data points and we have dates on them. So one example is we've talked about the LeBron Top Scrum PSA 10 a little bit tonight. Uh, thank you, Gary. Bring it up once more here. Uh, that card, historically, uh, it's actually, from the empirical point of view, pretty remarkable, is held at a 5x multiplier to the refractor PSA 10 analog. Um, now, does it always hold? No. Uh, there can be variation. In fact, there's there's quite a, a deviation from the historical correlation right now. It's, it's quite different. But the concept that uh, movements in one market can trigger movements in another is, from the data point of view, compelling. From the collector's point of view, potentially useful. Uh, from the seller's point of view, bad or good, depending upon which way it's moving in, in your direction. Uh, sometimes it can be precise, sometimes it isn't. Um, 
And then to Dr. Beckett's point, when you start getting into uh, cross-player comparisons or even cross-cards, um, you know, a lot of times it just doesn't hold up. If, if there's anything that's really humbling in trying to do data in sports cards, it's how often projects like that utterly fail uh, to, to have any predictive value whatsoever. Uh, the science of prediction, uh, science in general is uh, methodologically based on prediction. And the extent to which you can specify variables and then in advance and say under these conditions, if these variables hold, then the consequence will be X. The likelihood of that happening in sports cards is modest. When it does happen, it's very exciting. When it doesn't, it's humbling. Back to the drawing board. Anytime you're dealing with human behavior, uh, anytime you're with economics, uh, things that are influenced by irrational and rational decision making, uh, well, you're you're in for quite the ride. Uh, so, but but ratios, relationships between prices, between players, between sets. Um, the, the shrewdest collectors, of which I'm not, but the shrewdest get ahead of those those movements, and they see, oh, okay, people really like uh, the PMGs or something. So maybe Prism Gold is next. Why? What are the similarities? What are the benchmarks here that we're looking for? So I don't. Does that talk to ratios a little bit, Doctor? Yeah, you know, but I mean, even even within the same card within a grade, you know, the, the, there's not a one size fits all ratio of a 10 of something to the 9. If you just look at PSA, you know, but even within the Beckett scale, there's, there, there's not a fixed multiple, but there are some guidelines based on types of cards, how difficult they are to, sure. to jam and all that. So, And you guys are tracking that. So if there's enough data, I think you're doing a lot of the same things too. So The only problem is the tracking is from the past. And you know the spread between a nine and a ten is is gonna is gonna float, and it could get less, it could get more. It's not gonna stay the same over time. But you guys are gonna track it, and the savvy people are gonna see, hey, the spread is shrinking on these cards. Maybe it's gonna shred, uh, shrink on these others. That's making nines look like a, a good deal now, especially strong nines who, who, that are that have great subgrades or better IP. Oh, and while that's true, I'm a data analyst in retail, and you can say the same thing in retail. You know, your past performance is no indicator of your future performance. So no matter, you know, it's not just, there are multiple more, um, what are those, what am I trying to say, variables than there are in maybe what I do. But yeah, you, you don't know because take, for example, like I said, I work retail, COVID, you know. You that's, didn't have that in the bottom? We did not have that in the model, yeah. I could not predict that X category was going to literally sell out in one week. Um, so, I mean, at the end of the day, I mean, while perhaps imperfect, it's a hypothesis. It's an educated guess based on the, what you've had, and it's no different than in a retail or basically any other setting. You know, you can only do so much, and you can only work with the information you have, and you Unless you know something I don't, you ain't get, you ain't got a DeLorean to go into the future. I, I do kind of have just a question on that um, for the analysts in the room. Um, is there a weight that you give to certain things? Because I know like you mentioned pop reports earlier, uh, you know, being an indicator, and they are, but we've also seen silver prisms, you know, the pop report is nowhere near the indicator as much as just popularity and recognizability. Um, you know, spreads between nines and tens. Like, in your personal systems, do you have like a weighting class where you say like pop report is 15% of the value versus overall iconicness? You know, the, the spread on this card is heavier, you know, it's, it's heavier on superstars or it's less heavy. Well, but that varies from optic to select to, you know, every other one, because you can look at it at the category level, you can look at it at, a, you know, a secondary level, and you can look at it at a granular level. Um, and then it's reflective upon, you know, take again the things of off seasons. We all know, when do you buy? You know, ideally, when do you buy? You buy in the off season. Um, so there's just, I mean, yes, you can weight things. And again, I'm not talking about what they do, because honestly, I got no idea what the heck y'all are doing. Well, y'all are acting like it's, but, you know, Josh, speak up. I mean, basically, he's, Josh is letting the data do the talking. Yeah. He's not deciding it. He's, 
Well, I'm referring to the future where you were saying that, you know, it's kind of the same in every aspect of any kind of data analyst analysis, whether it's trading cards or retail. The POP report and with PSA's backlog starting to catch up, you're all of a sudden seeing, well, it was POP 2 yesterday, it's POP 35 today. Where's the sub report? That's yeah. What's <laughs> going to be and, and on a different type of analysis, Eric, you and I were back at Price Guide Analysts at one point. So you have a different way, how, you know, without divulging the secrets, you know, what, what were you do? you know, what were the diff some of the different forms of things you were doing to help produce the price guide? I would just email Josh. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, everybody asks that question. I don't know how much I can divulge there, so I'm going to have to... Well, I think we, I think we can say though we looked at all the available evidence. Yeah, we we had, yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think we can say as that as much and then, as possible. We're uh, trying to let the data do the talking. Yeah, and from a multitude of sources, I think that that you certainly can say without any. I, I, I think the biggest thing I would like to clear up is oh, it's just eBay or it's it's eBay. You look at eBay for the price. eBay is one part of the Beckett equation. It's not the whole Beckett equation. It, it, and it's an important part, but it's not yeah. the whole part. We didn't have eBay when I started. Right. We spent $91,000 one year on sending analysts around the country to Price Guide to, to view things in person so we had more than the ivory tower. Sending Rich to New Jersey. Well, and I, mean, well I saved on hotels that way. <laughs> you know, from what Eric says, it's one part of it. And I've been guilty of saying some of those things about Beckett. And, I mean, I've said it in a you know social media platform. But team over there and Jeff's team, how many times have you seen the same card within a week sell for 1200 and then 1800 and then back to 15? Why the hell is it selling at all these 30% difference one time to the next? So there's only so much you can do, even with the evidence that you have, you know, to try and predict that future. You're, you're putting the card before the horse. They're not doing anything. They're reporting what's there. No, I'm responding to where so you they, were talking about the futures, I know, though. They, they can't, they're not they're into the business. The pr future is only, here's the graph, and it, if it continues, this is what it is. But it's, that's why it could be 12, 18, 15. It can bounce around. It's not their fault. Sometimes I'm guilty of not saying what I'm trying to say. I'm actually in support of you guys and just saying that those there's just so much. Because you had talked about some of the things yourself, and you were just like, I don't know. And any, I was just kind of getting at any level of retail or anywhere that you, you analyze data, there's always that element of the unknown. And there's, yeah, I, I, I apologize. I was trying to actually say that, you know, it's not just in cards, it's, it's everywhere. Anybody that does any kind of data analysis. My apologies. Yeah, we, we just wait the actual sales on the actual dates, going back to all time sales history as much as we have. So we'll pick like, three dates in time and prices to ratios of similar cards as close to those dates and as dates as we can get, and then we map the ratios to each other, and then we pick as many of those going back as far as we can, and then we weight those and average those out so that you're just getting closer and closer to reality as far back as you can go. So the all-time You're, you're improving are, as you go. Yes, yeah, so each new data point we get where they sell within a certain range of each other, it's now improved and it's getting closer to the actual value. And we can't measure things like popularity and sets over time because you can't measure people's emotions. Let's, let's stop there. Brad, why don't you lead it off? Sure. I think that was a good follow-up question because I feel like when you see that, the more educated you get, the more success you have either as a collector or an investor. I would imagine you have a better time and you're less likely to get burned. And maybe you lose a bit of money on a card or you don't buy at the perfect time, but at least you're getting smarter every week and every month. And I know that that's helped me invest more and collect more and just be more enthusiastic, but especially as content creators that put in a lot of effort and we want people to enjoy the hobby because it's it's fun when people comment on your videos saying, wow, uh, thanks so much, I've learned so much from you. That's very fulfilling. So how can we keep that person, keep that person's momentum going throughout the next wave, whatever that may be? Well, any, the, any specific no, But the challenge is, to keep it going, not in a bull market, but in a mixed market, that some things go up and some things go down. That's that's going to be the challenge going forward because I think that's the new reality. But hasn't the market always been that way? Especially when now that we're back to normal player performance, where 
people are having good years or people like Luis Robert and Eloy Jimenez are basically out for the season. So the interest in their cards decreased, but Vlad Guerrero Jr. is having a really nice year and people are now looking at his cards again. So aren't we on some levels really getting back to a normalcy? No, with what's different now, and, and oh, Mike left. He's a, he's a financial guy. You know, the, the swings are wilder now. Things go up faster and they go down faster. And that's, so it's a different market. But my, but my point is, yeah, it is different in terms of- down, But they go way up and way down. But my point was more that it's still a more player driven again. Like last year, one of the issues that happened, we didn't have sports for four months, five months. Nobody went down because why should it go down? Because you're all banking on the potential now that we're seeing what's happening. And that's one of the differences too, that we're back to a normalcy we didn't have a year ago. I go back to the way up and way down. It goes back to the whole, there's more information out there quickly. Like even like five years ago, I wouldn't have I have a laptop sitting in front of me at this whole thing. It would be a piece of paper, or you'd be getting your box score still from, from a printed paper that is now like 12 hours too old. I mean, and it only had limited data. Now you can break that down instantly pretty much through multiple websites on how somebody's doing by the minute or by the pitch. Advanced so it, it, it causes bigger rises and falls. I think one of the key things about you know, just going back to this core idea about how to keep people in is really keeping people engaged and making them, one of the things I've learned a lot inside this industry and outside um, is come up with ways to make people feel like they're part of the content. Make, make them feel like they're building that with you. And that kind of goes back to Jay's point earlier when he was talking about community. It really makes people feel like they're kind of building this brand and this community with you and it's really hard to leave something like that. It's hard to leave something that you feel like you're really a part of and then encourage people to find what they want out of it. What you know find what you like collecting. And it may not be it may be the most the weirdest off the wall thing, but that's fine. If that's what you like, focus on that. And then help them, you know, get there. So in in whatever ways you can, find out ways you know, to just increase engagement and you know, find ways to let people feel like they're part of the content. I actually kind of want to piggyback on that to ask the more YouTube specific members in here, how do you do that on YouTube? Like, that's why I love Twitter is because that's where I do that. But on YouTube, how do you bring in the audience in that way? Um, you know, how do you keep them friends, not just viewers? So I keep a running list of everybody who consistently talks to me and beside their name, favorite player, favorite team, favorite whatever. When I go through Rich's box, if I see an interesting player or an interesting card or an interesting something other. No. So no. you're doing your CRM just like you did in your business. Yeah, uh, and, and, but it's not necessarily for business purposes. It's, dude, this guy's gonna like this card. I mean, I like this card, he likes this card, I was thinking of him. So, of course, being in engagement, I'll say, hey, card's on your way. Found a cool card for you. Not gonna tell you what it is. Card's on the way. Brad Tracer, though, he tries way harder than I do. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, for me, sorry, do you have any more? Because I did kind of jump, I didn't mean to. No, I, uh, well, the other one is, I'll also, uh, I just started doing different contests of like, Hey, um, like John was, John was at my house this week, and I just had him on, on the show. So for a whole week, I was touting contest, contest coming, contest coming. This card, this card, this card. Well, by Friday, everybody's like, "Okay, what's the question?" <laughs> Who's on the video? Something really good. I probably got the most comments that I've ever gotten. <laughs> You're welcome. Oh, yeah. no, <laughs> well, what I was going to say was, I apologize if you do not remember your name, but what he was saying about making everyone feel, you said YouTube, I reply to every comment. Yeah. You know, and that got beaten into me by Mike, who is no longer here because he talked about a lot. Even if it's somebody new you don't know, or they say, you know, thank you. At the bare minimum, thank you. But like every aspect of our hobby, whether it be the bloggers, the, twi the Twitter folk, 
it's all clickish. You get your little group of 10 people, 15, 20 people. Nothing wrong with that. But those people, okay, they get a paragraph reply because they were, you know, they gave me a paragraph. And we talk and, and those things. And that's, I mean, and that's a slow burn on gaining. I mean, they're, you know, the, these are, you know, people that are not going out necessarily trying to buy follows or just following everybody to get follows back, which I've done that in the past, so whatever. <laughs> But in general, just replying to everybody, making them feel a part of whether it's a podcast and they're rep- responding to you on Twitter because you shared your podcast. Hey, John, love this. Just re- just responding. I mean, literally, that's how do you build community? You talk. I go even one step further. I'll respond to negative comments. Someone says, hey, <laughs> I don't agree or you're wrong. I'll, you know, respectfully, I'll sometimes I'll say, you know what, I, I see your point. So, respond too, just yeah, not like that. Yeah. If you <laughs> if you respond even to someone who maybe is coming from a, a negative place, you they're they're gonna say, Hey, he even took time to talk to me or respond to me who wasn't complimentary or wasn't very uh, supportive. And I, I think that goes a long way to showing who you are. So And I don't call people by their name by their names. I call them by their name. I, I specifically try really hard to learn your name and to learn where you're from and to, and to really, I, I don't, I just don't. I mean, I like the first once or twice and then connect with them off on the, twi- on, on the Twitter or something. And then, you know, if, from there I say, hey, what's, what's your name? What team do you like? Or try to make that a little bit important. So when they jump back on, it's like, oh, it's David. Well, it's Michael. Well, it's Ken. We don't respond to Ken. But everybody else. <laughs> something too I want to say is that, um, you know, we're all attracted to interviewing like the, the heads of state and the hobby. But what about the normal guys? When I got started doing interviews in 2016, I just interviewed another Frank Thomas collector, and he just we he, I had met him the year prior, and we just got on and bantered for like a half an hour. It was great. And then put that video online, and now he's like part of that. He feels like more part of my channel. And you know, he doesn't own a company. He's you know he, he's he's like the rest of us. We're like normal people. So it's like kind of cool to have. To reach out to just people who are listening to your blog and they're just regulars on your, your, your they're regular viewers, you know, and, and it's nice to showcase them because they're special too. Everybody is, right? So um, pick a random viewer and, and be like, hey, when I have you on for talking about your collection or something, that's helped me. And it's, uh, I think they like that. I've had some good response from that. To build yeah. on his point, I'm sorry. And, and I'd, I'd agree with that. That's something we try to do on our show is if you have something interesting or, um, I mean, we've had someone who has like every hitcher card autographed by the, the living anyway, uh, that that are living signed their card. Um, we had them on for a quick few minutes. Really interesting dude. Really interesting collection. Um, it, it was not Tracy Hackler, Panini, or George Carlin at uh, Predict. Love it. Love both of those. George, George Carlin. <laughs> He's my favorite comedian. <laughs> I'm horrible with names, I'm sorry. Um, y'all knew who I meant. But uh, th- that's the thing, you know, uh, th- we, we try to bring on the regular people. We always ask for questions of what content do you see that you want to hear talked about? Or what do you guys think about the thing that we saw to drive them back to interact with us and get to know, know other people better? Or who are some new people in the hobby that you like and what reasons do you like them for? And we'll go and check them out. Maybe invite them on. So, Good. real quick, one thing that's worked a lot on YouTube, and I forgot the threshold if it's a thousand or a hundred subscribers, but live streaming is amazing. Because live streaming is just here I am, here are your comments, I can put your comments up on the screen, I can talk to you one on one, and now I'm building this interaction without writing a script, editing a video, doing all of that. And it's nothing builds community faster on YouTube, in my opinion, than live streaming. And I just forgot what the threshold is that YouTube allows the thousand? Okay, but it's amazing. I mean, it's great because you're like, oh, I just have a live stream tonight, hop on, what's up guys, da, 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 da. and then, hey, good to see you here, you're always in the house, how's it going? Da, da. And you're just interacting one-on-one with 10 people, 20, 50, 100, all at the same time, and then when you're done, it's done. Is to not discourage anyone. I think it's a thousand if you're using like a device. If you're on your actual laptop, it's, I don't know that there even is a minimum because I can stream live and I've got less than 500 
So, okay. but I know, like on my device, I couldn't do it. I couldn't stream this right, right now because yeah, I've only got. I think we're at eight seventy six. Yeah, I just wanted to right. not to discourage anyone. Okay. It, it's a little lower okay. if you're on a laptop or something. Yeah. You know, another way also is building out either like a Discord group or a Facebook group. So, and people are always going to be asking questions in there. They're going to be talking to you, and you can go out there and answer those questions, engage with people all the time. It's real time feedback, and just like the comment sections, you can always go out there with that. Instagram Live has been an interesting one for me. It's just been, I, I see different interaction there than I do on any other platform because I, I think that it's a younger crowd that's not necessarily being reached through your traditional blogs or your older YouTubers. So say, who has the most TikTok followers in the world? Jim, you've done a great job of getting a lot of people onto your podcast who Frankly, I'd never heard of, and they always Absolutely. have great stories. I mean, my, one of my favorite is the blind guy whose wife oh, describes right. all the cards yeah. to him. Oh, yeah. So, just give us a little background on how you find some of these people. You know, Rocco, he's, he gets a shout out every Saturday night <laughs> from Jeremy on yeah. Sports Cards Live because he's always there. And I was thinking, watching this show, oh, wait a minute, he's blind. <laughs> um, yeah, he's amazing. He's amazing. But yeah, you, you just. The thing is, you don't know that somebody's amazing until you hear their story. And Rocco was, was a good example of that. And there are others. I have this guy, Rich Klein, who comes on. Yeah. <laughs> I skipped those ones. Yes, so, so, so do I. You too, man. She's my, Rich is my, my wife's favorite host, I think. <laughs> I'm the, Bob, I'm the Bob Euchre, if you're old enough to understand that reference. I'm the Bob Euchre where it's the Tonight Show. Eric, didn't you something Yeah, I was just going to say, um, to build on, uh, I know you're just I'm sorry. Radic cards. Yeah. Um, to, to build on his point, being in the position that I'm in working at the company I work in, sometimes I am asked to interview heads of state or whatever, you know, we're in the card industry. But I get much more enjoyment personally out of interviewing the Twins collector who has, you know, a, a Byron Buxton's collection. And I, I would much rather talk to that person. So finding enjoyment in what you do, uh, speaking to you directly, Brad, I mean, you, sometimes you just have to do stuff that you just, you just don't want to do. But you bring those, you bring those guys back uh, by following up with something that you can clearly see the enjoyment in. I have a lot of those interviews where I've faked my way through it. <laughs> and, uh, but then the next episode or the episode after that, I have, you can, there's pure enjoyment in, in that episode on, on, and there's a connection on both ends there. But then there's and a mix of- And didn't you have something you want yeah, to- Yeah, sorry, just follow up on that. Uh, so as an editor, like a lot of people come up and say what's up and like, we kind of get a small clip of it. I try and include every little interaction because they took their time out of their way and said what's up and to reward them like it's maybe even five ten seconds in the video but like it means the world to them at that moment and like for us it's just like it's a small moment in our time and like just including them in the vlog is content and like it doesn't hurt to just add every little interaction it adds up but like it's what maybe like two three minutes of your main video yeah. Something I'll add to that is like you guys will see in our day one, day two, day three vlogs, it's a lot different. We're not walking around the show anymore. I'm set up and we're like doing deals, but like all these people are coming up like, oh, like, you know, I want to show you a LeBron. And they come up and they show and like, hey, we saw your vlogs. And they like, you're right. Someone hit a home run tonight, man. You wanted them to feel a part of, man. You got to bring them in. And like, that's what we, I mean, dude, everyone's come up to us and they're like, man, we love the content, and then they'll bring that cool card, and they'll tell a story, and, like, I'll just smile and, like, talk with them, but where are you from, or we'll see a kid, and we, like, put a stack of cards this big, and we're just handing them out, handing them out, we're not filming each one, but, like, we're just handing them out, and then we have the dad, you see the dad turn, I'm like, oh, that was so nice, and, like, when I was a kid, like, you can go get blasters and all that stuff, and, like, it was fine, but now it's, like, you know, it's, in, like, kids can't buy cards anymore. I they, can't buy cards anymore. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's like, and it's like the, the bigger picture here is like, I almost try to not make it about me anymore at these shows. I try to put them into it, you know, and that's like they're part of the story. You know, you'll see in the in the vlogs this time. It's cool. But kind of going from kind of what Eric said, you know, enjoying what you're doing. But going back to something that Ivan said earlier. Okay, those of you that know me, I'm not a fit for Jeff's show. There's nothing wrong with that. 
but I am have been with Eric multiple times. I've been with Steph and his team. So there is that level of we know there's no secret that there's a lot of people doing a lot of different things in the hobby. So, you know, if you are more of a collector folks, you know, do you need to have those heads of state and vice versa? I'm not a fit for a lot of the folks in here and there's apps I have no problem with that. I understand it. I understand where I what I kind of what area of it I'm in. So that also, you know, don't alienate your your core but your core audience the great. That's yeah, what I was trying to say. By uh, you know bringing on somebody that really just doesn't fit, just doesn't fit your typical core audience, because you are trying to. Every channel is trying to, at some level, put together their own community, and you want to continue to appeal to that community and not have them click that unsubscribe button. Uh, getting Ken on a positive note is a good. <laughs> <laughs> it's late. Thank you for. <laughs> so I guess for me, the fear is that it's not always transparent. Um, you know, an, an example that's a little transparent is there was a gentleman who was posting a, an in, like a card picks to Instagram of like, here's the three best cards of this guy to invest in. And someone found, but it was not transparent, his eBay account. But someone found it and said, you know, it's really weird. You put their best card, their second best card, and then some really random card, and you happen to be selling that random card under eBay every time yeah. it happens. But now with consignment, with PWCC, with ComC, with you know accounts that don't have names uh, on social media, it's like, you know, I don't know. So I guess I'm just asking at least to the people in this room who are all here, because you know, none of you are, you know, literally looking around, none of you are the ones that I can think of four examples of this in the big hobby. And none of, none of you guys are examples that I've seen do it. But like, what is our responsibility? But at the same time, how do I go out and buy my Diego Rossi rookie cards without them going up? Here's what I do. I keep an eye, I keep my ear to the floor on what everyone's talking about. If they're talking about it, I'm not buying it. Unless it's like super, super specialized PC, I'm talking like number to fives, number to ones. Things I'm not going to see again if, if they're talking about it. Um, and then I wait 30 days and see what happens. And when those people are now dumping these cards because they've realized that they don't like them, now is my time to go and look for these cards that I've been looking for. Well, and so, so being, being super transparent, um, the, the three guys on my podcast all have very distinct, we are fans of this team, we collect these players, we are fans of these players, we collect them. So, a perfect example from earlier this season, Akil Badu. Huge opener of the season, hasn't done much since. Started with the Twins, now with the Tigers. I'm, I wasn't looking to pick them up in April, but now that they're cheap and available, I'll pick them up for my set needs. On the show, uh, we're pretty consistent about this is what we're looking for. Clear as day, hey, we have some of these, these are available for sale. We're never you know, behind the scenes saying, well, no, everybody should buy this card because it's the hot card, and oh, by the way, I bought 100 of them, they're currently not even. That's just not something, we, I, for the most part, we, we, don't, we really don't even resell. Um, but we, we like to be very transparent of, this is what we have, this is what we've recently picked up, this is what we have available for sale, so that everyone knows. I think so many owners falls on, on people in general. I mean, you, you, I've never bought a car because someone else told me to do it. Yeah. Um, you know, it's the old to blame the gun or, or, or blame the person, right? So if I buy a car, I didn't listen to someone to tell me to, to do it. I just, you know, I was born sort of being a sports fan and, and following the sports is why I got into the hobby. So. I'll give them a pass. I'll give those folks a pass that are saying that. You know, if someone tells me to jump off a bridge. I'm not going to jump off a bridge. So, are people influenced easily? Sure, but who, whose fault is that? Where does the blame uh, fall? That I think that's even more of the, the question. I mean, that's America. You can last I do, unless it's hateful or, or illegal. You know, you can say kind of what you want. Well, it's a free market, right? So, like, it's really up to the buyer whether or not they want to educate themselves on what they're buying or not educate themselves on what they're buying. I've seen a lot of fake cards sell for huge money. And so, like, 
you know, sometimes I feel prompted to be like, hey, by the way, this is the uh, this is not a pack issue 1990 Upper Deck Reggie Jackson autograph because the hologram on the back is not diamond, it's circular. Circular is the standard issue. The diamond hologram is the pack issued autograph card. So people didn't know that they would be into the card. I only had, already had a bid. I was like, somebody bid on this. Someone's going to lose out. As soon as I say that, somebody listened and pulled the card from eBay. So it's like you know you kind of. You're doing your part, but it's not it's not up to me, it's up to the buyer to like not bid or bid or whatever. It's really up to them. I think it, it, it's difficult to place direct blame, but a lot of that blame can fall on the buyer because they they should have known better. A caveat M tour, right? Buyer beware. I mean there's a lot of education out there on what to look for, uh, for example, for a fake PSA case. And a a lot of that can be done via our different outlooks because everyone should probably know what they are looking at. And if you don't, it's buyer beware at this point. So. Well, Jeff, if you're talking about lowering the bar, yeah. it's impossible to lower the bar yeah. too, too low that people come in, oh, hey, no problem, and they don't take David's course. <laughs> it's not like it's been, it was only seven hours, Start but there. it's seven hours that most people don't spend. And then they come in, hey, everything's fine, they listen to somebody that sounds like they know what they're talking about. So how are you straddling that? Yeah, well the challenge is that, you know, there, one of the topic suggestions was FOMO. And there's, you know, with how hot the sports card market was last year and the first few months of this year, and all of the regular press and publicity was getting on ESPN and CNN and you know, all these other sites, it was causing a lot of people to go like, wait a minute, like am I supposed to be in this and you know do this to make quick dollars? The, and then of course those people come in and they just want to toss money in. And then you see these bubble cycles, right? And you see top, what happened with Topps Project 2020 last summer and you see what happened with um, Tiger Woods cards in November and then you see what happened with NFTs recently, right? Um, and NBA Top Shot and stuff like that. And so the challenge is that one of the other topics we want to talk about is how do you, you know, get more people in and make it sustainable. And if they come in, and if you just put all the onus on them to be like, well, buyer beware, yeah, but if those people come in and have a bad experience, they're not gonna come back. They're, they're gonna get turned off, right? They're gonna, they're gonna get burned because they listened to the card pick and then the card was in a bubble period and then it crashed on the other side and people make, made money off their ignorance. And it's, that's, that's a tough thing. Now, at the same time, how do you, how do you police it? Like, what do you do about it, right? Like, it's, I, I don't know. It's a tough thing. It's, you know, we, we try more and more to repeat the message in our content around education. But it's, it's, uh, it's a tough challenge. I, I don't know exactly what the solution is to it. But it's, I definitely feel like there have been, absolutely been people that have come into the hobby over the past 12 months that have gotten, that have had really bad experiences because they've come in at the wrong time. And I bet there's a whole bunch of people right now that bought cards on February 12th, 13th, 14th, 15th, 16th, and 17th that are in bad shape right now because that, you know, un, you know. Jim, let me ask you. Beckett Magazine was famed for never doing investment advice. And at the time you had by far the biggest mouthpiece in the hobby uh, producing more than a million copies by 1993 each month. How, you know, you, it really wasn't that much of an issue. Did you really even have to think about it or did you just say, we're just going to go this way and just... Well, it's, it's not the right thing to do. You know, and basically you can't... It's... Uh, people are born self-interested. Okay? But there are boundaries that society puts up says, you know what, this is okay and this is not. But well, I mean, what you're saying, it's not okay, but it's not illegal. You're misleading people. If, if you have, the more people you get in the hobby, you're, you're not never going to have a pure hobby where everybody is looking out for the other guy and doing the golden rule. So, but we, but um, what we did, because I wouldn't necessarily czar, but I, I was the boss of the company at least. And so the, the, the people on our team, they just, they, you just have a, a cut and dry rule. We're just not going to, we're not going to give investment advice. We're not going to be dealing in cards and things like that. It kept it simple because otherwise you get into gray area. And so the people you're going to criticize, they're probably going to 
claim it's a gray area. Yeah, I'm touting it. Yeah, I have it. But yeah, I still think it's a really good deal. And, and people ought to do their own homework. But people don't do their own homework always. And so, you know, of course, if they listened to every podcast in this room, <laughs> they would have no time to sell it by cars. <laughs> Maybe it just comes down to a disclaimer. You know, you have to constantly rotate the disclaimers. Like, by by the way, we're 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 not here to tell you exactly what you should, how you should spend your money. I know, but it's these guys just, that are touting, yeah, they could say that, it, like the uh, like the uh, the cigarette warnings, at the, end, or the, the bad pharmaceuticals, yeah. uh, the side effects, where they're going to go real fast at the end. You know, it's it's. Uh, People still hear what they want to hear, and it's such. And and what Brad was saying, they're master storytellers in many cases. They're t they're tickling the ears. Well, and it's also it's not always just shilling. And so that example I used in the picture, he literally said, "Hey, I'm buying these." Does that mean he was sitting on a bunch and shilling them, or was he actually buying them? And he doesn't care if they go up fifty bucks because he's worth three hundred million. But Maybe he just likes the card too, you know. Well, exactly, but it impacts the market. Right. It, you know, it vastly impacts the market. You know, um, so I guess I'm just wondering, like, where where our responsibilities lie. Yeah, I mean, you're has been doing that consistently for the last year and a half. I mean, he's, what opinion are you going to have on it? But he's not a fly by night. No, no he's great. He basically is doing I've, it and doing it and doing it yeah. and doing it. And are people telling him to stop? No. I personally think it's fantastic. And because I he's going to have a track record. And to be quite honest, you wanted to know, we'll talk about the market dip. I, I think part of the market dip is that Gary Vee in February shifted his attention from sports cards to NFTs. And honestly, I think that's part of your market dip. Good news is the other day he tweeted he's buying tops, tops LeBron, LeBron or you know Chrome cards and that he's going to be at the National. So I'm like, all right. That, that, that NFT launch for Gary was a little rocky, so we're past that now. I don't know. So I'm kind of thinking maybe he's going to come back over to the card world a little more this summer and things could go up. But, I mean, but yes, it, it's that type of thing, right? But I don't know. It's tough. The one thing, I, you know, so one thing that um, I will say has advanced a lot in the last year, thanks to Card Ladder and some of the work that, you know, we're doing and others, is access to data and information. And I have had the theory that if you can get people access to market data and information and make it more readily accessible and easy to access, then that educates people and that allows people to make smarter decisions more quickly. Look what happened and, to the stock market. I mean, Robinhood with Web, Webull right? and all those other apps that yep. entered the whole, yep. whole sphere with all that information mm -hmm. and now all of a sudden your neighbor's now, now selling Random stock. <laughs> yeah. And, and, it, and, and in the card world, the downside, the access to information, is now card letter and us. We're now targets for people going on eBay and, and placing fake bids on, bids on items and then not paying for them. Because they figured yeah. out that eBay doesn't report that information back to us. Mm -hmm. So we don't know if that sale's legitimate or not. And now we're left to our own devices to look at the buyer feedback rating and stuff like this to try to figure out. Was that real? Was that not real? Does that fit the pattern of the most recent sales of that card? Or does that not fit the pattern of the most recent sales of that card? And now all of a sudden, we bear a responsibility of trying to not let people manipulate our own data to then manipulate the rest of the market. So access to information data does have a little bit of a double-edged sword to it in that it's, it's not perfect either. Okay, we're kind of out of time for that one. Ivan, last word on a positive note. Can you wrap it up? Um, on a positive note, I sincerely don't think that anybody in this room is on that list of pumping numbers. Okay, thank you. <laughs>